bit about me. I'm the CEO of Clint Marketing and Architecture Quote. Uh, these are two very different tools. Architecture Quote is a bit more of a pet project that's turned into something real, and Clint Marketing has kind of been a really fun play at trying to tackle essentially the old school way that people tend to scale either small businesses or large companies. We use growth hacking data to basically do marketing and, and that's kind of the unique selling point there. Um, more about me, these are some of the Danish startups that I've worked for and built teams for. How are you doing, Gens? Um, so yeah, uh, basically I do a ton of public speaking. Um, in terms of growth secrets, uh, it's kind of been my pet project. Did that get unplugged? No. So the reason I started Growth Secrets is pretty simple. I, I found that there weren't a ton of events happening. I, I actually did a couple of events for Google Success Online. Did anybody go to those by any chance? Yeah, one person. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so those were free events where anybody could come and learn, and they've since stopped doing that. I don't know if it's because they've lost funding, but I've heard rumors that that was the case. I just want to give cool shit away for free. I found that when I was back in Washington, D.C., I went to two to three events a week, and you guys are doing the right thing for, for being here, but the reality is, where else are you going to learn the stuff to get better if you're not hearing how other people have scaled or what other things are working? There's a lot of theoretical stuff in this and a few points that might not be exactly proven through my own experiences. Um, there's a couple of dates coming up uh, for those that actually want to come out to some of the future ones. I, I promise there's going to be more people at the next one, but um, yeah, how to build your growth hacking team is on the 13th of March. On May 27th, <clears throat> I'm going to do AI and marketing. That was my presentation for a tech festival and we had over 400 signups and we were in a really small tent, so they turned away a lot of people. Uh, so I wanted to give that one again. And then I'm finally doing my two-day masterclass on the 29th and 30th. Uh, it's significantly cheaper than what you would spend over at Growth Tribe or, uh, I don't know, there's a dozen or so, like Hyper Island charges 4,000 euros, I think. Uh, so mine is 7,500 kroner, so significantly less. So get in now, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, there's a link on clintmarketing.com for all that good stuff. <clears throat> I've already kind of talked about some of my pet projects. Architecture Quote is supposed to disrupt the way that people find new opportunities and collaborate within the architecture industry. I am looking for new clients, uh, and I have a, an interesting ask at the very end of this if, uh, if there are any corporates in the room, so we'll see what happens with that. So my goal for today is provide value. I want to give people at least something at, at its minimum, something to bring up that's interesting at a cocktail party, Otherwise, something you can immediately implement right away. A lot of my presentations are rapid fire and fast. Uh, it's done that way for a reason. If you want my slides, connect with me on LinkedIn. Just make sure to send a follow-up message. The only people I don't give slides to are competitors. So if you run an agency or an architecture firm that gives deals to architects, which I don't think that's the case, then you got my slides. So a quick question of the audience. How many people here actually work in a corporate? All right, we got, we got a few. Okay, cool. But the vast majority, I assume, how many people here work in startups? All right. And how many people here are marketers? A couple. Okay, cool. What do you guys didn't raise hands for anything? What do you guys do? Oh, I forgot students. It's good to learn. So cool. I'm totally with you on that. So um, I mean no offense to any of the corporates in the audience. Uh, I'm going after kind of my own reflections and what I've experienced in terms of the problems with, with corporations over the last two years. I work for a company called Valuer.ai. I was a CMO. I interfaced with a lot of C-level head of innovations, CTOs, CIOs, and I saw a lot of really consistent issues, and I'm going to address those from a startup perspective. Lars from Oracle will be going into a lot of his genuine experiences of dealing with this stuff. And thank you again, Lars, for, for coming out. I, I wish I could have brought you know, an entire stadium out here for you. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> so let's jump into it, because I, I find this stuff fascinating, and I, I hope you will too. So the problem that I have, or the problems that I see with corporates are multifold. This was a quote from John Chambers. John Chambers basically says 40% of Fortune 500 companies that don't partner with startups will become irrelevant in the next 10 years. 
So he's essentially alluding to the fact that a lot of these big players, big companies, these giant forces of, of economic growth are slowing and they're having their own set of challenges in terms of finding new revenue streams, finding ways to continue to make the money they used to 5, 10, 20 years ago. And the reasons that I've discerned that I think are, are as a result of that is missing talent. Nobody wants to go to the biggest players anymore because honestly, it's more fun to go to Facebook or more fun to go to Google. And I can't blame them for that. Uh, there's disruptive startups that are taking away market share from industry leaders who for the last 50 years, in some cases, were the only game in town. And now there's startups saying, no, we don't have to do it that way. Bureaucracy, and that'll be a common theme throughout Culture is very obvious to me in terms of some of the, the biggest issues in terms of startups and corporations coming together. And lastly, revenue focus. The issue with anything turning into something magic over the next five to 10 years within a large company and an R&D uh, department is focusing on quarterly bonuses. And I'll go into that stuff because, I don't know, it, it, it bothers me. Uh, so the reality of this stuff is actually quite daunting. So the average company lifespan of the S&P 500 list, which is the top 500 companies within the United States in terms of revenue, in 1965, it was a 33-year lifespan. This shortened to 20 years by 1990, and it's expected to reach 14 years by 2026. That means the biggest players that reach this pinnacle of success won't stay on top of the mountain very long because it's getting way more competitive on a global scale, but also with startups. And that's why a lot of us might have gotten into the startup scene, or maybe there's a different reason for it. But the reality is this is a changing landscape that many of us should be a part of and, and are potentially going to change it by being active in either your, your industry or coming out to events like this. So talent, talent's crazy. If you look at this list, and I realize it's from 2017, and it feels like that wasn't three years ago, but it is. These are some of the top tech companies in terms of what they pay their average employees. You see Facebook at the very top at $240,000, which is absurd, followed by Alphabet, Google, right? Netflix, Twitter, and then the first one that's on here that's a traditional old school corporation is Exxon. The reality is this is why a lot of people graduate from Ivy League schools and go into the stock market as a stockbroker because there's a shitload of money. And that's what we often follow as young graduates is where's the money at? Now that's changing with generations. Generation Z, uh, very similar to the millennials, maybe not so money focused, which could be good, could be bad, who's to say? Uh, but what you end up getting out of this is essentially these big tech companies that are bloated and don't necessarily have the best in the business playing for them anymore. So it's an interesting landscape and it's constantly changing. Disruptive, uh, disruptive startups are basically changing the whole game. It used to be the top three players owned everything. Now you have startups that come from nowhere and essentially take over an entire market. It's death by a thousand cuts for companies that used to essentially run entire businesses in different sectors. Now they have to start limiting their spend because they're, they're running into so much competition and they're losing on all fronts. Not everybody, but many. And so that means we have to find different ways to either generate revenue or collaborate with some of the up and comers so we don't lose in the long run. So it's a difference between competing and partnering. And that's kind of what this startup partnership is kind of all about. And I want to show this really fascinating example because it, it's a new phenomenon. The idea of blitz scaling. So there are startups that get an infusion of capital that are essentially able to take over entire markets because fuck, who can compete with that level of money? So one of my favorite examples is how Uber was defeated by Didi. Uber is a force to be reckoned with. I mean, we're talking soft bank money, right? And I want to show this really short clip that's fascinating as uh, somebody that basically says, look, what you're going to encounter in the future from Chinese companies is the way that Westerners, gentlemen, compete with gladiators, the Chinese, through this phenomenon called blitzscaling. So I wanted to show this video real quick because I find it fascinating. Bum, bum, bum. And hopefully the audio is here. First of all, there's really crazy competition over there. Best illustrated by this example, when Uber tried to get into China, there was the Chinese Uber called Didi, and then Didi basically said, okay, there's a new competitor, so for the next couple of months, everybody can use our service for free. The riders can go for free, the drivers, they don't have to pay any commission to us, and so let's see what Uber can do. And then Uber was forced to do the same thing. 
And then they did this for months and months, and some friends of mine, basically for one or two years, they didn't pay anything. And so Uber was burning one billion a year, two billion a year, then they would announce that they would raise another three billion in venture capital in order to succeed in China. And then the Chinese company said, okay, if you're going to raise three billion, we're going to raise 20 billion, and we're going to play this game as long as we want to. And at some point, Uber just said, okay, we're giving up. We're going to sell our China operation to Didi. And now they basically disappeared from the market. And the competition there is so crazy. And there's, there's this very famous author, Kai Fu Li. He says that Western entrepreneurs are like gentlemen, and Chinese entrepreneurs are like gladiators. So basically, they don't know any rules, and it's really cutthroat competition. They do kind of play dirty, but they really manage to build really, really big companies. And even companies like Uber, that are really known for really tough business tactics, had a really hard time succeeding over there. We talked a lot about this really fast pace, and this concept is called blitz scaling. And blitz scaling means, OK, we prefer speed over efficiency. So we have to move fast. And if some things don't work, then so be it. If it's inefficient and very expensive, so be it. So speed is everything. And they also take big calculated risks if the reward is big enough. So Didi is thinking, hey, this ride-sharing market is a 100 billion, 200 billion, 300 billion dollar market. So what's a 10 billion investment or what's a 10 billion loss in the long run? So they really, really think long term and are willing to take those big risks. But they know that they have to move really, really fast. And that's where the blitz scaling comes in. So that's the idea. It's, it's essentially trying to take over a market by who has the biggest wallet. And we've seen that in a lot of different places, whether it's scooters, whether it's ride sharing, whether it's something in the way of home delivery of almost cooked food. There's a lot of different markets that people are infusing so much money into in the hopes that they'll take over early and be able to hold on to these customers in the long run. The reality is what we don't see is what happens to these large companies that don't continue to deliver a good service and also they're charging super low prices or free in order to capture an entire market. What happens when the user doesn't want to pay for something that they never paid for to begin with? So it's a really interesting phenomenon and I, I'm curious to see how it turns out in the long run, but um, yeah, very different. Let me jump back into this. So the next topic is bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is, I think, why a lot of people might avoid working in a large company. It, it, it means everything. What uh, this depiction here is, is basically, uh, it's called the circle of death in nature. So ants on random rare phenomenons will essentially go in a circle until the entire hive of ants it, it dies from exhaustion. It, it's a weird thing and nobody knows what to accredit it to, which is kind of fascinating. And the reality is there's sometimes that type of thing that happens in a large company because we do the right thing for too long and we don't know how to hit an exit strategy and try something different because the money's still there and it's currently okay. But what's going to happen in five to 10 years if we keep in this system? And the reality is nobody really has answers to that, but I do think it is fascinating. Pivots are almost impossible, especially if you've defined a project and you've said this is the way that we're going forward. It's very difficult to shoot down ideas in that kind of political environment. And I, I think it's really fascinating to see from a startup perspective, the meetings for the sake of meetings, and I'll go into that stuff later, but uh, yeah, it, it's a tough environment to, to really play in. And in terms of culture, there's definitely a very different culture, even in Denmark, which has a very flat hierarchy. And I, I love that about this country. I think there's a lot of influence in the United States from the military. We have our ranks. I think it's far less uh, a thing here. But startups seem extreme in terms of the intern that walks up to the CEO and said, hey, I, I saw this thing online the other day. Uh, do you think that would be interesting for us to pursue? In the United States, it would be, get the fuck away from me. In Denmark and also, you know, in some of the you know, startup worlds, it's like, okay, what do you got? Like, tell me more. So I think it's just a very different culture in terms of large corporations and startups. And then revenue focused. Uh, I kind of alluded to this at the beginning, but I think it's incredibly important to understand that often bonuses dictate our decisions. So if you are quarterly focused every single quarter to make sure that you're showing revenue, why are you going to take chances? Why are you going to try something that might end up working out in five or 10 years if you know that you're placated on whether or not you deliver within this three months to one year period. And that's dangerous, right? That means that, hey, I'm gonna leave all the problems for the next guy I'm focused on right now. Golden parachute, what's up? And that's a problem. 
And the reality is sometimes there is a real challenge in incentivizing people to do the right thing, but also do the right thing for the company when you're not here anymore. And that can always be a challenge, but there's different ways to incentivize. And I'll go over some of the failure bonus stuff that I like. So the radical outsider effect is one of the really cool concepts that's in innovation. It's basically the people that come from outside that have a direct change on an entire industry. And I'll, I'll go through a couple of examples. But this is one of the first slides that I often lead with when I go into some of my growth hacking talks. So marketing and innovation, in my eyes, are very similar. The idea is understanding one system really well gives you something in the way of the ability to apply the learnings from this system to another. So in marketing, if you understand how to write decent content, you can start to play the game with PR and amplification, understanding how to get other people to engage with that content. Then once you understand that, you can get a little more technical. You can do some SEO. You can start to understand the nuances of SEM and so on. So if you understand one rudimentary system or one really complex system really well, you can say, hey, that's kind of like this, but a little different. Let me show a couple of examples. So this is what a badass looks like. This is John Crowley. John Crowley had 20 years under his belt in finance, and his two children uh, were diagnosed with a neurodegenerative disease called uh, Pompe's disease, which basically means the kids are doomed to death uh, within the next five years. It's very similar to Lou Gehrig's disease. So John Crowley decides, okay, I'm going to quit my job, I'm going to raise $100 million, and I'm going to find anybody that is in the biochem and biotech industry who's working on neurogenitive diseases to come work for me and solve this shit. And so he does. Three years later, saves his daughter's life and sells his company for a cool $137 million within three years. So it was a radical outsider that decided, I want to mess with this. And he obviously had a reason behind it. And that's a really interesting case, if you ask me. Uh, I haven't found the right way to position this. This person was originally born a man, now is a lady. Uh, and basically, uh, uh, Martine started out as an expert in space law. So graduated with a law degree and just by chance got into kind of the space and aeronautical engineering sector. And so decided at that point, I'd like to start a global version of satellite radio. This became Sirius XM worth 40.64 billion, then went into United Therapeutics for uh, basically a cool 1.5 billion uh, in revenue every year. Uh, and part of the reason that she got into this was because uh, basically she wanted to figure out how to help her daughter who had a lung illness that would have essentially ended her life early and she perfected the way of keeping lungs healthy outside of the body. That's fucking amazing for somebody that got a degree in law. So it's just going to show you that if I can figure out one system, I might be able to apply the learnings to another. The last one is your stereotypical San Fran kind of bro. Uh, so college dropout developer. Uh, was working on dispatching systems, super bored, and decided, I want to do this, but for an online platform that allows microblogging and communication. That turned into Twitter. Twitter is worth ungodly amounts of money nowadays, $27.86 billion. And then he was like, cool, I want to do that again, but with like financial uh, credit card processing. So he founded Square for $20.18 billion. A different mindset, approaching very old problems and seeing if it makes sense, which is what it's all about, if you ask me. So innovation in the real world, how do we do this on our own? How do we do this with engineers? How do we make sense of this from somebody that wants to get involved with something that's innovative? I've always found that engineers work best or some of the people that I've worked with that were really talented when you give them limitations. So you say, build me a house without any real uh, equipment. Build me a house with no mechanical machinery or I'm giving you a box, work your way out of the box. This is how we invented a pen that cost, whoop, cost a, a million dollars in space. And, and it's, it's one of those things. Good things can come from this and very strange things can come from this. So another example of that would be this guy. Everybody knows Steve Jobs, right? So Steve Jobs basically proposed, build me a phone with a camera the size of a wallet with no buttons. And it's my favorite thing. I, I want to pull it up and I share this like once a year just because I don't know. I, I, love, I love how people react to like new technology. And I'll kind of go into that uh, a little bit later, but I wanted to show the reaction in 2007 when people saw the first time that somebody swiped on a phone. Now, obviously a bunch of years later, 13 years later, 
we look at this as something so novel and so ridiculous, but at that time it was magic. Nobody had ever done that before. Now we do it all the time with Tinder. All right. Oh. Sleep wake button. There we go, right there. And to unlock the phone, I just take my finger and slide it across. All right. You want to see that again? We. <laughs> it's like really, what? like people in the audience were like, Whoa! like it was it was unreal because nobody had done that before, right? You mean you don't have buttons on the glass? Like no, we don't need them. That's magic in some circles. So the reality is these were, I guess, originally seemed to be impossible feats, but something magic happens. Another example is one of my favorite entrepreneurs who's super eccentric, Elon Musk. So Elon Musk basically tasked his engineers with build a rocket that is cheaper than existing technology, make it reusable, allow it to carry, or carry bigger payloads than any existing technology. People don't realize the reason that rockets are so damn expensive, it's the engine, it's not the fuel. So if you can save that engine at the very bottom of this propelled basically explosive, then essentially you're saving two thirds of the cost, which is what he's done and he's put NASA out of business more or less and a lot of other private uh, firms that were trying to get into aerospace. I left WeWork in because it is novel and this is also why I have challenges of my own with branding and strategist folks. So WeWork basically set out to disrupt the co-working space environment or the office space environment. So they basically said only procure large, really expensive offices within metropolitan areas where people are kind of coming and going, where startups hang out, make rent cheaper than a regular office, don't require long-term leases, rent individual seats, which was mind blowing at the time, and make renting office space sexy. There's a reason that these guys make the entrance of their office super fucking beautiful and then the rest look like basically hallways. It's because they want to give people an impression of, hey, this is this cool, sexy thing, check it out. Now, more recently, I think most of us have seen the news that it's been devalued significantly because all that really was was fancy branding. There wasn't anything super unique about the company. And there's going to be continued versions of that in the future. My last one on here is Ikea, a hometown favorite. So Ikea has been playing super heavily on, on basically self-driving. So how do I make the experience of going places come to you cheaper than a cab using existing infrastructure roads and then allow users to complete other tasks along the way? Imagine going to work and having a mobile gym come to you and take you to work. Instead of you going to the hair salon, the hair salon comes to you. Instead of you going to the hospital, the hospital comes to you. That's a, a giant paradigm shift in what we've actually originally seen, but it is possible. So I love this quote, and this is kind of more geared towards uh, what you saw with the iPhone, but any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I think all of us can relate to that stuff when we see it. For the first time, the, the first time that we saw something that's like, oh shit, like a robot that vacuums, and now it's like, get out of my way, you know, like it, it's a thing. So I, I'm, I'm always like really interested in terms of how people imagine we get there. And I've borrowed some interesting things out of this one and I want to show what I envision being a great way to get there, but also with some borrowed stuff from BCG. <coughs> in my experience, innovation will always start from the top. <coughs> Excuse me. You have to demand change. Uh, you have to give chances to people that might be unlikely players. You have to be a part of the change remove barriers. This is true for anybody that manages anybody. One of the hardest things as somebody that manages a marketing team is making sure that I take away all obstacles and say, here's an open playing for, uh, <laughs> open playing field, fucking run. And, and the problem is not a lot of leaders do that. And I think as generations continue to age into the workforce, you're going to see people that say, I'm independent enough. Leave me alone. Let me make you a lot of money. And in some cases, this might actually work. The last one is be there, give a shit, and also challenge and inspire. I've been to a bunch of hackathons and usually it's the CTO or CEO that shows up at the very end to deliver a novelty check and like, no, 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 don't touch me. It's the weirdest thing. It's like, if you really care about this, be a part of this, hang out for two days. Like, we'll all smell gross together. But it's so strange not seeing that. 
So there was a really cool presentation that I watched over at the President's Summit uh, last November, this past November. Uh, this is Rich Lesser. He's the president of BCG uh, the U.S. And, and basically had this really cool structure that I like how he broke down uh, that was basically the leadership stack for winning uh, basically the 20s, the next decade. And the reality is like, I, I, it really resonated with me because I, I build marketing tech stacks. I'm like, oh, cool. Um, so the first one is compete on learning. So essentially, if you become the smartest company, you win. The idea is that how do we collect enough data throughout the entire structure of our company and feed it back to people that actually care and want to reuse it? So that means data and HR, supply chain, sales, marketing, etc. Sole contributors, meaning the people that actually are doing the work, are giving feedback back into the organization. I want to know what's working if I'm on sales and marketing is struggling to hit their numbers and vice versa. Integrated departments will be a huge thing in the future. Why the fuck is there no engineer on the HR team? Why does that not exist? And the reality is they haven't thought to do it because it's like, no, no, no. Potatoes and steaks stay separate. Not anymore. That's not going to be the future. The reality is everybody needs to be exchanging information. There needs, <clears throat> there needs to be... Man, I need to quit smoking, huh? <laughs> uh, there needs to be a knowledge center, more transparency, which will be the case, uh, and a feedback loop that allows people to basically confirm suspicions and, and essentially carry out new and, and interesting tests. Building the bionic company is basically people and machines working together. It's very similar to the, the concept that I explained before with data. These feedback loops are, are going to be a huge part of every company, but the concept is also integrated documents. So the concept of being able to drag out reports from each and every side of the company automatically. No more repetitive tasks. AI is supposed to solve this problem. There will be a focus on soft skills, but not the way that we think of like, hey, everybody's creative. I think there needs to be a focus on defining what a leader actually is or defining something in the way of team teamwork and, and, and combining thought processes. That's part of the future. Not so much like, yeah, I'm an, imp like an empathetic leader. I, I don't know what the fuck that means. So internal programs becoming a service is, is starting to become a real thing as well, which is fascinating. So like Twill is, is a, a brainchild of Maersk. So Maersk tried to figure out its own logistics problems. So it had a bunch of people working on logistics. And they're like, well, this worked for us. Why don't we just sell this? And, and that turned into an entire new business model. Solving your own problems and then finding a way to sell that to others is going to be huge business. And these are really low-hanging uh, fruit. Uh, UPS has done relatively the same thing. And I think there's new revenue streams coming out of that. Uh, the, the one that I think is, is kind of interesting is being honest with yourself. And that's the science of change. So uh, what, are we, what are we here to actually do? Uh, where are we headed, organizational goals, uh, you know, how, how are we going to get there and, and what is going to happen between here and there. And so I, I straight up stole this graphic and added a few local players because I, I loved it. He defined the different ways that corporates are kind of sitting in different areas of growth. So on the, the top side, escaping the swamp. So Best Buy, for those that don't know, is basically like a big electronic warehouse where they, they have a big box store. They sell everything from phones to laptops. And these guys were in real trouble recently. They could not get out of their own way. And the way that they solved that is they went into the service industry. So they're like, cool, you bought all this crazy shit to make your home smart. You know how to set it up? Nope. Well, let's get you on Geek Squad and I'll charge you for that for the rest of your life. And it's actually worked out. We can see a local player, whether it's 3, TDC, or BR. These guys are finding it really challenging to continue to scale. Now, obviously, with some of the telecom networks, they got 5G coming, but hopefully that's a revenue stream that's going to carry them on for the next 10, 20, 30 years. The next one's crossing the river, and this is more of a B2C play, which I find fascinating. So the example that he gives is Starbucks. Starbucks collects all kinds of data. It's brilliant to have one of those Starbucks little gift cards because they know exactly when you come in and exactly when you leave, which is pretty awesome. But the idea is that they can start to determine cohorts from the information that they're gathering on a grand scale. So the lifetime value of a person that goes to Starbucks, a female that is now the age of 40, is $22,000. One person who is going to Starbucks every day, grabbing her little latte, 
So if I can keep this person coming to my establishment or multiple Starbucks, I win, right? It's a big deal. And so Carlsberg and Danske Bank are trying to find ways to keep their customers engaged and involved, and they're not exactly sure how to cross that river. We have data, but what do we do with it? Climbing the hill is really fascinating. So they know the technology they need to actually implement, but they don't know what the top of the hill looks like. So uh, John Deere, super old tractor company. Everybody's seen the logo. It's that one up there. Uh, and also Aristod, they know they need to add IoT so they get more data out of what they're doing and what they sell. But the reality is, what are we supposed to do with that and how do we upsell it? And so there's kind of an unknown there. The last little bit is planned itinerary. So Maersk knows we're in shipping, we have data to do something with shipping, and we'd like to get a lot more streamlined with where we drop off stuff and where we pick up stuff like logistics to the extreme. Ikea knows people are never gonna stop buying shit, right? Everybody's gonna have an apartment at some point, they need shit to put in there. That's just gonna be part of life. Staples is office supplies. People are not just gonna all of a sudden say, I don't need office supplies anymore, they're good. The last one is really interesting and I think it would be a really cool place to be to live in one of those environments, which is, yeah, scouting and wandering. So Google has ungodly amounts of money, so does Facebook and Amazon. Lego does too, quite honestly. And they know that they have something in the way of a future, they just haven't figured out where are we gonna throw a lot of our money. And that would be a really cool place to play if they were gonna hire me. Um, but yeah, <laughs> something to think about. So this is a topic that I'll lose half the room on and I'm not gonna make this a huge debate. Uh, and I, I wanna go into a certain direction but harnessing diversity actually will work in the future, and you'll see a couple of reasons why. Uh, my background is psychology, so I always love throwing a psychology principle in here. Uh, the beauty premium phenomenon is one of my favorites. So basically, when we see attractive people, we assume that they're smarter and more capable than they actually are. We all do that. There's a reason that Leonardo DiCaprio is not taken for second guest as a potentially a fraudster. It's like, he looks like a pilot. That guy looks like a partner, dumbass hiring manager. You know, the reality is we have to be a little more objective with why do we have a knee jerk reaction to think that somebody knows more than they do. One of the biggest challenges that I often see inside of the startup scene is understanding the difference between grits and IQ. Just because you went to a really fancy school doesn't mean that you have any more chances of success in terms of compared with somebody that does grit. Uh, I think explaining this is kind of helpful. So talent times effort equals a skill. Skill times effort equals achievement. So that means if you work longer at something and harder at something, you inherently will get better at something. And ultimately, if you work that much harder, you will essentially be the best at something. I want to work with those people. And also, <laughs> a degree in psychology wrote numerous papers on personality tests and also failed numer uh, numerous personality tests. If you are focused on a personality text, uh, test that only measures the outcomes or effectiveness, you're missing the whole thing because most of the people that release the documentation on personality tests being a good indicator are selling personality tests. So you might as well say, hey, take this test. Which Disney character are you? Come work for us. Because it just doesn't work. And the last little thing that I'll go in on <laughs> on diversity, because it, it, it throws me, and I'm sure many of you have been in a similar situation. So at a large company, they're saying, all right, we need someone with fresh ideas, an out-of-the-box thinker, uh, someone to challenge the status quo, something different, a creative mind. Like Everybody's like, yeah, high-fiving. Everybody's like, yeah, great idea. Then they go to write the job description, and the job description looks like this. Requirements for the job must have 20 years of experience right, with us. Ivy League or similar, business degree, MBA required, right? 10 years minimum in management consulting. So what is the outcome? This, he's perfect, it's the same guy, he's me, I love me. So unfortunately, nobody wants to hire based off of grit, merit, passion, execution, potential, uniqueness, and resilience. I believe in all kinds of diversity, so long as we're measuring against those things. We can have a million purple people if purple people happen to be super driven, motivated, and have the merit to get there. That's what I'm all about. Uh, I've said a lot of good things about BCG, and now I'll, I'll rib them a little bit. Uh, so this status came across uh, my LinkedIn yesterday, uh, three days ago. And BCG, Denmark, really excited. Uh, they're like, hey, look at our new partners. And that's good branding. Like, I, I want to, to know who are the movers and the shakers. 
So one of the first comments was, where are the women? There's only two, so that's kind of fair. My question is, where are the startup founders? Where are people that have run their own businesses? Where are people that have controlled an entire company? Where are those people? So I looked through their backgrounds. Nope. <laughs> and then the last, uh, the last two of the 18, uh, yeah, somebody that was an owner and an owner and co-founder, uh, and the longest one was for a year and four months. Uh, I've never seen a startup other than Instagram that was successful over a year and four months. So I'm wondering, is this not more of the standard? Or is this just, hey, like, well, you know, it, we'll get there eventually. Why not do it now? Why not hire somebody that is different? And I think the reality is it's really challenging to step out of line and suggest something like that. That's what this box is all about here. The future 50 biggest companies in Europe will look nothing like the previous 50 biggest companies. What is to come? The ones that are small in startups right now, that will be the biggest unicorns 5, 10, 15 years, will look nothing like the biggest companies that are currently in our kind of general periphery and what we know about today. So hiring a non-fit seems dangerous, but also it means you get blamed if that non-fit doesn't perform to the standard. And so it's a scary thing, and I totally get why that isn't working. But in the future, it will work itself out. These smaller players continue to build an industry that doesn't exist. It'll be there. Last little bit is, uh, actually, we've talked about this in terms of greenwashing and greenwalling. So is it possible to create societal good while also increasing shareholder value? The small, short answer is, of course. Making money isn't evil. Pretending you're saving the world to make money is. That's super fucking evil. And I hate people who do that. It's not a bad thing to want to change the world. It's a bad thing to lie to people and say that you actually give a shit when the reality is you're just going after easy money. I think the biggest money is gonna be in closed loop systems. Reducing waste to zero if I am a cell phone manufacturer and just like the circle of life, everything gets put back into the funnel. I think it's coming and it's gonna be really fascinating. And those are the things that people should be putting money into. And I think it's fantastic if anybody in here is working on anything green related, I'm all for it. I'm not saying that, but don't be afraid to make money. That's honestly what keeps businesses in business. And there's a reason they used to call them nonprofits because they don't profit. Um, so what happens if we don't change? I know I'm kind of getting tight on time. Yeah, I got another 15 minutes. So what happens if we don't change? This is a picture right here of the Nokia paper mill. So uh, Nokia was originally a paper mill in 1871. And over many, many years, they iterated, they shifted, they changed the way that they were doing things because they realized that maybe paper isn't going to be the only way that we generate revenue. Now, obviously, Nokia is kind of that, that known quantity for innovation that didn't pan out. But there's lots of other examples of this. And the problem, again, is doing the right thing for too long. There's a great example on here, AOL, which was big where I come from, outside of Washington, DC. Uh, AOL was worth $224 billion in the year 2000 to 2015. They got acquired by Verizon a few years after that for $4.4 billion. So like 220% less, which is pretty absurd. I'm sorry, 2,204% less. Crazy, crazy. I'm not going to dive into those examples. These are some of my more favorite ones. These are recent ones. So Boeing. Everybody knows Boeing. They're in the news lately, right? Anybody know that they hired $9 an hour Indian developers to work on their navigation, which ended up plummeting not one, but two jets into the ocean and then into land, right? That's 189 plus 157 dead. They're looking at billions, like billions, potentially not getting out of it in terms of what they owe from lawsuits of companies saying, hey, we ordered a bunch of these, where's, where's our jet? To people saying, you killed my loved one. It's 101 billion. Uh, in terms of what they've lost just within the last year. That's a problem. Accenture delivered a $32 million website that never went live for Hertz. Danske Bank, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm just shitting on people, I'm sorry. I think they're good examples. Uh, Danske Bank helped drug lords launder money. Uh, GE can't get out of its own way in terms of selling off what GE was known for, light bulbs. They got rid of it, you know, and the reality is People are making either really short-term goals and decisions in order to see hopefully a little bit of money saved for what they're losing out in the long run. Why save a dollar today to lose out on thousands in the future? If any one of these companies had decided, you know what, 
We need to try to find a fraud detection company that is a startup that's willing to play ball with us and we'll support them. We need to find a really cool development firm that's doing next level shit when it comes to integrations. We need to find an aerospatial engineering firm that can help us with our navigation. None of them did that because they got lazy and they're like, well, fuck it, my friend works there. Let's get them to do that. That's a problem. And of course, these are just people and they make decisions based off of feelings and instinct. But maybe in the future, they can look at merit of startups that are actually passionate about what they do. Uh, I did a really fun interview with Gary Vaynerchuk, super short, where he talks basically about what happens when corporations fail to innovate. Uh, I don't have enough time to go into that one. I'll show <clears throat> one really old school example. Uh, example. This is Kaiser Permanente. Uh, my dad hates these guys because they always charge them a co-payment. Um, but they originally started out as shipbuilders. So it took them 131 days during World War II to churn out one ship. By the end of the war, they were churning out three ships per day, which is absurd. They got super optimized. They got so optimized, they opened up a hospital on the shipyard to make sure they could get people back in and working. They're now the top US healthcare provider for the second year in a row. These guys are worth 79.7 billion with a B dollars every single year in revenue. It's absolutely absurd. A few other great players that are out there. This is Google X. Everybody knows X, Google, right? They take absurdly large problems, problems that affect millions, potentially their customers, find a radical solution, test it, and then optimize it for efficiency. So one example is the first driverless car, right? 1.2 million people die on the road each year. Let's build a car that stops on its own and avoids accidents. Cool, they did it, right? The next one is there's 4 billion people on the planet that don't have access to internet. So they basically created weather balloons that pump down 3G and 4G signals to allow all these people online. Now guess who they're gonna get on and do some searches with, right? And I'm gonna get lots of data on you when you're traveling in your little car, but the reality is these guys are gonna be taking over the future for <laughs> the rest of time, potentially, if they continue on that path. It's pretty wild. Uh, last little bit, I still got a little bit of time. I really love the collaboration with startups and I, I wanna show why that is. Again, I have a different perspective than most people when it comes to this, so just bear with me. Uh, when I first met Chris Ye, he, uh, he wrote the Blitzscaling book, the, the, the topic that we were talking about before. I kind of made this analogy and uh, my CEO at the time kind of winced at me. He's like, the fuck are you doing? I'm like, no, 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 it makes sense. Um, so I, I look at a lot of the, the biggest companies that are starting to kind of fade out as the out of shape Olympian. This is Rulon Gardner. Uh, he was a wrestler, not like WWF, but wrestling for Olympic gold. So he won the gold medal in the year 2000 and he beat out the favored Ruski. And it was a big like story in America. And so afterwards, he got super out of shape. He was on a show called The Biggest Loser. Uh, and it's a show about people losing weight. And the reality was that he lost sight of the things that used to make him the best which was, hey, worked out every day, ate well. You know, he had something in the way of focus. He was resting on his laurels. Or in other words, saying, hey, remember when I won that gold medal in the year 2000? It's like, dad, it's 2015. What are, you, what are you talking about? You know, and the problem is, in order for a lot of these large companies to say, look, gee, I know you guys did great with the light bulb, but what have you done lately? The reality is they need a change in attitude. That means leadership. So in this show, The Biggest Loser, they basically had to get him to convince himself he was ready for change. Better diet slash personal chefs. Think of startups as the ingredients, fresh food in terms of lettuce, tomato, chopped up onions, whatever, throw it in a salad. If he doesn't know how to cook for himself, he's certainly not gonna lose the weight. So the idea is startups and something in the way of a CIO that are infusing these two together and saying, look, you can cook for yourself. And the last one is a personal trainer. So consultants that say, here is how you carry this forward. Here's how you maintain this lifestyle forever. And a lot of these companies that are trying to do this are finding different ways to kind of cobble together ingredients and I hope it works out. Startups are different. Let me see if I'm doing okay on time. Yeah, I still got a little bit of time. Um, this is me kind of talking about startups. I saw somebody post a, a picture of the movie with Will Smith, I Am Legend on LinkedIn. They're like, yeah, it's tough being a startup and an entrepreneur. Uh, you know? And I'm like, okay, yeah, but minus the dog and the fucking sun. Like there's a reason that it's really rough out there. Everybody tells you you're full of shit, you're not worth their time, and nothing good is gonna come of it. 
that's really hard to move forward with. But it builds a chip on your shoulder, and for me, that's jet fuel. That's motivation. I get motivated by that jazz. Like, I'll show you. And I think every entrepreneur has a touch of that in there. That's something that if you have that inside of a large company, that might not be a desired trait. You know, it depends on the company. Um, but there's a lot of passionate people, and I believe they do work harder. Use bootstrapping or understanding how to work around expenses or challenges is kind of what startups do. Other times, large companies throw money at problems, and that's kind of another solution. Uh, they're fiercely independent, and that's why a lot of these startup founders don't always work super well with these large companies. They definitely believe in that grit over IQ. And here's the interesting part of why corporate should work with these people is because they've already started to solve the problem that they're looking for. It's a real thing. So if you ask any VC, and I'm not saying that VCs know everything, but when you ask a venture capitalist, what are the top three elements of a startup that you evaluate when you're, you're trying to decide if you're going to invest? They say people, people, and people. And it's like, fucking good one, you know, but okay, fair. So the reason that they say people is because they believe in the stuff of the previous slide. It's not where you went to school. It's not your previous history. It's what you're trying to do to solve this problem, how passionate you are, and the team that you've built around it to get it done. And there's no difference between what is happening within a corporate venture as well as a venture capitalist. And if you can show them that that's something you possess, you're already ahead of everybody else. So where do corporates find startups and where can you be found as a startup? Accelerators and incubators, there are always competitions. UNoodle is one of the greatest resources to go to to just constantly apply. Competitions, there's not a lot of pitch events in this town. I used to do like one a week. Uh, and it's, it's really actually quite fun. I, I, maybe I'll get involved in that one day. But um, startup conferences, hackathons, school and academia, obviously. Random Googling is how a lot of people do it. Um, and then an in-house startup analyst that gets way too much money to basically Google stuff, which is crazy. <clears throat> so the reason that acquisitions don't go well if a company's ever been acquired by a startup, it's basically you're now kind of partners with, it's like, well, fucking nice helmet and racing gear and nice bike. Like, I'm just a little startup. Like, how do you get all that stuff? And that, unfortunately, is kind of the scene and how people migrate into that doesn't always mesh well. So the analogy that I use is, the fastest fish in the ocean is the sailfish. If you take the sailfish out of the ocean and throw it on land and say, all right, do the same thing that you did in the ocean. Go on, get. It's not going to work. It's the same thing with taking the fastest animal on land and throwing it in the water. Why would you do it any different with startup, uh, startup leaders and people that are actually good at what they do? Don't take them out of water. Encourage them where they are. Don't do anything in the way of this kind of internal innovation stuff. Give them a chance to run on their own. Fuel them. Give them fuel, and that's all you really need to do. Last little bit. I'm down to my last little bit of minutes. Um, I really love Astro Teller's name. He sounds like a man from the future that predicts like people's fortunes. Um, but <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's a really great name. But he's he's got an amazing head, uh, TED talk. And my favorite quote from this TED Talk was basically describing the failure bonus. People at Google get paid to kill projects. So they get promoted for it, failure. We have bonused every single person on teams that ended their projects in failure. Meaning there is no concern for killing a project that will just bleed money out of a company. We kill it and then we move on to the next one. You're safe, you're with us. Uh, and then the other one, of course, Thomas Edison. I love that. You know, I've not failed, I just found 10,000 ways that it won't work. Um, let me finish out the last little bit. I have a couple more things. I'm going to skip past that. Um, you know, the, the biggest reason why startups often fail come down to mostly like infusion of wealth and lack of testing the market. Uh, and everybody claims a different statistic, so I don't, I don't know how you have such varying degrees. Um, do a Google search and like everybody has a different answer. Uh, but if you were able to say with certainty that most of this came down to resources or a little bit of user testing, we'd have a lot less startups that failed. So if there's a large company that's inside of your industry that is willing to give you a shot and say, we'll give you money to make sure you don't fail, why wouldn't you do that? And the reality is startups have what I described, that chip on your shoulder, I don't want to work with them. And it's like, Cool, if you don't like your future or money, then that sounds like a good call. The reality is this is a lot more of what the future will look like. So, um, 
I wanted to briefly describe, and I have a few more minutes, of what it is that I'm doing and what it is that I'm focused on. And if there's anybody in the room that's open to helping, I'm all for it. So first, uh, I'll start with a very simple question, which, why are there no growth hackers in large companies? And, and it's kind of confusing because I see a lot of companies that have more than enough money to employ some of the fastest and smartest growth hackers that are out there. And there is obviously kind of a barrier there, but most growth hackers don't fit the background because they have blended backgrounds that come from a mixture of sales, different industries that didn't work out, and they're non-traditional, and, and you guys can tell by my language, I don't really fit the traditional mold. Um, they're often sole contributors, meaning I have to learn by doing the work. I can't talk about strategy. I need to focus on actually writing this and understand it through and through and then deliver and then understand strategy. If I've never had to do that, then I don't consider myself a growth hacker. Uh, I need speed. I need to test fast and move on. I want to do that. And I see that being the case always. So that's why you don't always see that there. And also, most good growth hackers come from like broken homes, broken startups. Like that's just what happens. Like you have to learn from, you know, the only reason that I don't use HubSpot and I've had to figure out all these other tools to go around HubSpot is because HubSpot is $20,000 a fucking year. I can't afford that. So I cobble together about 12 different tools to work around it. And I'm really good at those tools. I'm not great at HubSpot, but I don't need to be. So I, I, I actually found out from Lars earlier that I was wrong about uh, the idea behind Barclays. And, and here's what I'm kind of working on. I'm letting everybody in on, on what my future goal is. So I want to create a growth engine and launching pad. So basically any company that has an infusion of startups that are eager and want to continue to grow their companies and projects, how can I help? And the answer to me is I've grown some of Denmark's fastest growing startups. Sure as shit could help out with a lot of companies that have thrown money at startups to grow very quickly. There's a lot of people that understand their product really well, but maybe don't fully understand how to mechanize growth and infuse tools for faster growth. So my goal for a growth engine is basically to allow entrepreneurs and some of these corporate projects to forego the really messed up learning curve of how do I find early growth? How do I get the traction the fastest and test different platforms and different channels? How do I test prior? You know, a lot of people are like, well, what is growth hacking? And it's like, damn, dude. So market validation, all that other stuff. What I do is I essentially want one company as a partner. I'll be an employee of theirs, quite frankly. Like I'm totally down to play ball. I want to build a team inside. And this is what I thought that Barclays rise, actually rise from Barclays did. So a team of seven that basically utilizes the protege effect. The protege effect is really simple. And by the way, I'm doing a presentation on this in March. Um, the protege effect is really simple. You learn better and you get better at a skill by teaching it to somebody else. That's why every team that I've created has at least one intern underneath every employee so that they're constantly teaching. Not only the intern learns, but the employee learns a lot faster as well. I want to create the growth engine for all these really cool, interesting projects. Uh, you know, I don't want an organization to lose all the lessons learned by just throwing money at the problem. I want to create that kind of knowledge base. So what I'm essentially looking for is a seat at the table. Uh, the reason that I don't have the seat at the table is your boy is not the polished version of the Harvard grad that came into BCG and clearly I don't fit the mold, but if somebody wants to dance, I'm more than happy to dance with you. Um, so that's about it for me. Um, I hope you guys got something out of this. I'm definitely going to stick around for beers and questions, um, but I've taken up a ton of time and I, I want to give Lars plenty of time to, to get up here. So thank you guys for coming and I hope that was worthwhile.